so much for coming tonight. This is a special global hotspot um, uh, discussion that the International Affairs Forum is sponsoring tonight. Um, as you know, we have our monthly lectures that we do on the third Thursday of the month, but sometimes an opportunity comes along that is just so uh, pressing and the speaker is so impressive that we decide, well, let's hold something on short notice. And uh, looking at you all here tonight, clearly uh, this is a topic that all of you consider very pressing. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize that we have 60 students, 68 students maybe from Interlock in here tonight. And so, yeah. <laughs> I've seen uh, also plenty of students from TC Central, TC West. Whoop. From the college here. So thank you all for coming out and particularly for making this accessible to uh, students. Um, you may know that the International Affairs Forum is an education organization. We are now in our 23rd year. We are nonpartisan, we do not take uh, positions on issues, and likewise, we do not typically support NGOs. We do not typically uh, try to raise money on behalf of any other organization. Yeah. However, when we learned that Dr. Rhodes was going to be back here in the area for a short break from his work in Jordan, where he works with Syrian refugees and uh, before the Syrian crisis with uh, Jordanian uh, uh, students and children, um, we felt that there would be indeed strong interest from hearing, someone, hearing from someone who is on the front lines of this crisis. We also knew that there might be some of you who would be interested in not just learning about it, not just as an educational uh, opportunity, but as an opportunity to actually help in this situation. So that goes beyond what the International Affairs Forum does, but uh, because we wanted to also offer that opportunity to you, we are partnering with the Utopia Foundation, which is a Traverse City-based um, uh, foundation that uh, was started by Paul Sutherland in 2007, and they do work overseas, uh, here in the local community, and we were very happy to partner with them because they are going to handle the issue of of any donations tonight, making sure that they go to the right place, um, because again, that goes beyond the scope of what IAF can do. Um, because of their generosity, they are matching the first $1,000 that is raised here tonight. Um, and I'd like to recognize Lindy Bishop, who is the executive director of the Utopia Foundation, who is here tonight. Lindy, thank you. <laughs> right back here. <laughs> Um, in just a moment, Dr. Rhodes will come on stage. Um, it has been a pleasure to uh, meet him this afternoon and to have dinner with him. I can tell you that he is uh, the genuine article um, and that any substantive question you have on the Middle East, I think that he is going to be available to answer that. Um, he's going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we are going to open up uh, for questions and answer. I'm going to have Jack Siegel, who many of you know, come out on stage, and so the two of them will basically uh, take questions, and that will still give us, uh, hopefully, plenty of time um, to go in the direction that you would like to tonight. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to all of the volunteers who have been at the reception table, Kyle on the camera, um, the Jack up in the sound booth, all of these people that come together for these events and make it possible, so thank you all. So um, I'd like to introduce right now Dave Zender. He is from Harbor Springs. He is on the board of QuestScope, which is the uh, organization that Dr. Rhodes uh, founded and uh, now uh, works with in Jordan. And uh, Dave Zender is going to come up and introduce Dr. Rhodes. So Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. It sure is a privilege to be here and see all these uh, interested faces here. 
Uh, I've been involved as a board member for Questcope for the last 21 years. Over that period of time, I personally have made over 20 trips to Jordan. 15 of those trips involved visits to Syria as well. Questcope is a nonprofit, non-government organization. We do social development. We particularly work with socially marginalized communities, and we've been doing this since 1988. Many of the people we work with have been refugees. We've got 30 year history working with refugees. Many of them have been from a Palestinian background, some from Iraqi background after the Gulf War, and for the last three years we are very, very involved with the Syrians. I've been fortunate enough to make two visits to Jordan this year, and both visits I visit the what's called the Zatri Syrian refugee camp. This is the largest refugee camp in Jordan. It did not exist four years ago, but now is the fourth largest city in Jordan with a population of 85,000 people. So if you can imagine 85,000 people living in a two and a half mile square campground, that is what the Zatri camp is. But it's not like a northern Michigan campground where you got trees and you got water and seagulls. This is a desert, quite a bit different. The number of Syrians that have come into Jordan. I want to try and put this in a perspective we can relate to, because unless you've been there, you can't relate to it very well. But imagine every Canadian emigrating into the United States in a three-year period. How would we absorb that? What would we do with them? And how do we continue at that stage? That is very much what is going on in Jordan with the Syrian refugees. When I was there, I asked the people, what can a veterinarian in northern Michigan do to really help you people? And they had two requests. Please go home to the States and share our story with people from America. And number two, please, by all means, keep Questcope running because it has given us hope. Without that, we would have no hope. So I'm scratching my head thinking, you know, I'm a guy who normally gives rabies shots. How in the world am I going to pull this off? Well, I thought nobody better to present the story than Dr. Kurt Rhodes. Him and I first met on the campus of Michigan State in 1972. And his career in the Middle East, he's lived there for 35 years, started in 1981 when he was the assistant dean of public health at the American University at Beirut. In those 35 years, he has lived in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and the last 25 years in Amman, Jordan. In 2011, he was awarded the Social Entrepreneur of the Middle East Award from the Schwab Foundation of the World Economic Forum. With that introduction, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Kurt Rhodes. Thank you. My wife is from Alma, Michigan. I was a southern boy who came to Michigan to study at Michigan State University. And before I left the South, my grandmother sat me down and she said, if you want to go up there and study, I reckon that's just fine, but don't marry one of their women. <laughs> well, I did. And as we say in the South, and there I was. My wife also went to Interlochen every summer, and, and you have cost me a fortune in flutes and flute lessons, okay, which I have very willingly paid. Um, and of course, everyone knows that a silver flute sounds differently than a normal flute, right? So it's a, a requirement. What is a quest scope? In 1981, January of 81, I was at the American University of Beirut as the assistant dean in the School of Public Health and an associate in the School of Medicine. <clears throat> in the summer of 1982, my wife and I were walking across the campus of the American University, and I realized that there were things falling out of the sky and there were pieces of twisted metal from anti-aircraft guns, 
And that was the first time we were aware that the Israeli army was invading West Beirut. Over a period of the next week, we decided that I would evacuate my wife and two small daughters under five. Uh, and I stayed behind for two or three months to do triage for the families of the Palestinian fighters who had been in the camps of Sabra and Shatila in the southern suburbs of Beirut. These people were men, uh, were uh, elderly men and women, women with their families, and mentally and physically challenged individuals. At the end of that two-month period, we thought that the war would, had ended, so all of these people went home to the Sabra and Shatila camps, and all of them died in a massacre over a period of the next two days. So some three to 6,000 people were killed in that two-day period. That really did a job on my head. I thought, how can I go on with my career after having seen this? So I, over a period of the next year or so, I withdrew from my responsibilities in the university. I decided that I needed to find another way to serve in the Middle East apart from uh, academic teaching, and that's where Questcope was born. Our motto is putting the last first. It's so easy for people who are last to be erased. So I thought we need to figure out how to put the last first. So I want to tell you a couple of stories and give you some thoughts, and then I'll follow your thoughts as we uh, deal with your questions. Syria, which is my favorite place on Earth, and Aleppo was my, is my favorite city on Earth. Aleppo, for those of us who watch our waistlines, is probably one of the most dangerous cities to live in because you'll gain a pound a day while you're there. Syria had 22 million people at the start of 2011. Today, 11 million, half of those people, have no place to live. Some of them have been displaced four, five, six times. Of those 11 million, four of them are refugees outside of the borders of Syria. So four million are dispersed between Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and some even down in Egypt. <clears throat> It's mind-boggling. I don't know how to tell you about 11 million people. That's the population of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Imagine putting the population of Minnesota and Wisconsin in northern Michigan somewhere and having to come up with uh, food, housing, clothing, and it gets kind of cold up there, right? I've lived in the Middle East all these years, so I wouldn't have to be cold. The thing about the 21st century and wars is that you, wars don't kill people like they used to. So you end up with lots and lots of refugees from conflict. It's kind of an unprecedented thing in our modern history. And in the 21st century, for this crisis, there are no refugee camps. Now, Dave Zinder just mentioned one. So we have one in Jordan that holds 85,000 people. But remember, we have 4 million people who are refugees and another 8 million people inside of Syria who are displaced. There are no camps inside Syria. There's nowhere to go. The only other place where there are a couple of camps are in Turkey. But Lebanon, who has almost 2 million refugees, there's not a single refugee camp there. Refugee camp is an important concept because if you are recognized as a refugee, then you are protected according to the, uh, the Helsinki and Geneva Accords for refugees. You cannot be, uh, you're not subject to arbitrary uh, police action. Your children can go to school. You can get medical care. These are things that refugees are guaranteed. But just because you crossed the border didn't make you a refugee. 
the, government, the host country government has to say that you are and give you the documentation. In Lebanon, there is no documentation for those two million people as refugees. In Jordan, we ha give people documentation. Um, in Turkey, most people get some documentation. So this is, this is a new thing. This way to be uh, affected by war is to be turned into a non-person. You're extra. You're, you're here, but nobody wants you, and there's no place to go. The other interesting thing is there are two things interesting about 21st century refugees. The second interesting thing is that the Syrians are highly educated as a refugee population. So refugees are aviation engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, all other kinds of ed agricultural engineers, environmental engineers, teachers, university level and down, uh, nurses, accountants, clerks, lawyers, doctors. So the 20th century solution for refugees was that you corral them in a place where you can control so that you can give them food, you can give them water, you can give them shelter. But if there are no places, and you have this highly educated group of people, what's going to happen? The Syrians are very, very entrepreneurial people. They're called the businessmen of the Middle East. One of the things that happens is that people who are that educated and that experienced, they want to do something for their people. So a doctor wants to serve, a nurse wants to serve, uh, an accountant will say, you're trying to hand out food and you're trying to give out cash vouchers. I can do it better. Uh, we have a program to mentor young men and women in the uh, refugee camp that David referred to. And when we laid the program out to Syrians who have been trained to work with youth and social workers, they said, well, this is all very well and nice, but we can do better. And I said, then do better. I'm with you. It's a different way to think about people. They are not a liability. They are a resource. In Syria alone, we have 1,600 staff and volunteers who are working today to make sure that 200,000 Syrians have water, blankets, a shelter over their head, uh, psychosocial support, psychosocial and trauma counseling, that their children have some thing that they could call education. 200,000 people, 1,600 staff and volunteers. In Jordan, where we don't have the 8 million displaced people, we only have a million and a half Syrians who are refugees. And uh, in Jordan, we work both inside the camp of 85,000 people and outside the camp where the rest of the 650,000 registered refugees are. I had a discussion. Uh, my wife, my wife, my daughter Nadia, who was a little girl when all of this started, is today an instructor of classical Arabic at the University of Kansas. So she comes to Jor Jordan to go to the refugee camp for a vacation because they're her kinds of people, right? She grew up among Syrians. She speaks Syrian uh, Arabic with a Damascus accent, which if you're tall and you've got long hair and you're a pretty girl, that's hot, okay? <laughs> Fortunately, she brought her new husband and so that created a safe space that nobody intervened. Um, but as we were talking with the Syrian refugees that we are responsible for, in our space in this 85,000 person camp. <clears throat> they said, she said, so what, what is the, ch the challenge that if you could solve that one, it would make the other challenges easier? And immediately three or four of the Syrians says, we are people, we are not sheep. We are active. We can do things. We can make a difference. Let us. Respect us. Enable us. 
I carried the conversation further. And of course, in the Middle East, if you're going to have uh, deeper conversations, there are some gender issues. So, you know, eventually I moved off to one side of the room with almost all of the males, and Nadia was surrounded by a whole bunch of females and some very brave males as they were talking. And I said, so, uh, Muhannad, tell me, you know, I've known you for three years, and you came here with your shirt on your back. He's an aviation engineer. And they said, T you know, just tell me one more time what we're doing together, because it overwhelms me, and I'm not a refugee. He said, look, when we came here, we brought nothing, and we had nothing, and we thought we were nothing. But there are other people, other Syrians in the camp who are younger than we are, and have less experience, less education. He said, so by your enabling us to mentor them and to guide them, you gave us something to do with our hands, and that put hope back in our hearts. On the way over here this evening, we were talking about refugees and displaced people and war. And the statement was made uh, that was uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was a great uh, Israeli uh, proponent of peace. And he said, we will have peace when the Palestinians have hope. We cannot let the Syrians lose hope. Once people lose hope, they, you can be enticed into anything if you have no hope. Because you could try anything, right? It's so critical that, as Dave said, do you know we're here? And if we're here, you know, does it matter? Well, I think we know that they're there, and I think it matters to us. Hope comes from getting your hands back in action, and there must be some kind of nerve that goes from your hands to your heart that gives you hope. What do you do for displaced people and refugees? It's, in a, in a way, it's very simple stuff. People need water. If you bring a bunch of water in, you've got to get a bunch of water out, right? So you have water and sanitation. Um, if you don't have a job, and half of the people in Syria do not have jobs, none of the refugees have jobs because they're not allowed to work. You don't have a job, you don't have some cash. You don't have some cash, you don't have some food. You don't have some food, it gets really bleak. So the World Food Program provides food, except they didn't in September. In September, they ran out of money. Just in Jordan, it takes $215 million a month to feed that many refugees, just in Jordan. They ran out of money, so they did what you would do in the 21st century. They sent out text messages to 230,000 people saying, on Sunday morning, which is the first day of the work week, there's not going to be any more food vouchers. Just like that. Well, you would tend to lose hope, right? If people can arbitrarily do this to you. But we could understand the World Food Program ran out of money. Today, they found some money. And they didn't actually find it a donor or a donor country or two decided that, well, we really shouldn't let Syrians starve. So now the World Food Program can do this again. If you're a Syrian, what are you going to feel like? Ping pong ball? Tennis ball? Bing, bing, bing. That's not the way to build into people that you respect their dignity. In other words, this refugee situation is pretty bleak. We're Americans. We can do bleak. When things get rough, what is it? When things get tough, the tough get going. We do this as Americans. You challenge us, and we respond. You show us a need, and we figure out inside of our pockets, well, I can do without a latte this week. You know, We respond if we know. <clears throat> There are people who were never eligible for the World Food Program food. 
and those are Palestinians who were in Syria who have now been displaced a second time to Jordan. And there's no UN agency that has a mandate for a double refugee. So there are somewhere between uh, 10 and 18,000 people in Jordan that no one has a mandate for. So guess which population Questcope is serving? That's one of our populations. Because we're always looking for, if there's somebody at the bottom, can we go a little deeper and find another bottom? And those are our guys. Um, the, uh, this puts parents in unbelievable pressure. Because if you're the mother, this is a true story, if you're the mother of four daughters and a, and a, and a young son, would you sell one of your daughters so you could feed the others? I can't see you because of the light, but I mean, would you sell one of your daughters so that the others could eat? That's a terrible decision for a mother to make. But mothers are having to make that kind of decision. So when we discovered this, because our program for young girls includes informal education, it's like, what? Why would you sell her? I know somebody who's got a job for 30 bucks a month. You don't have to sell her. So we contacted a Jordanian who works in Saudi Arabia, a bunch of Jordanians who work in Saudi Arabia, and said, this is the story, and they said, Man, 30 bucks a month, that's not even a dinner. So the idea of the 21st century is that we're all, we are all wired in, we're all connected, we're all together. So when you connect us and we get together, we do really remarkable, amazing things. So the suffering is breathtaking, but the response can be remarkable. Last thing I would like to say, it's not the last thing I'd like to say, but I'd like to give you a chance to say something. Mentoring. Mentoring is too easy, okay? It's such a simple idea that somebody looks at somebody else and says, I'm, I'm your champion. You can screw up, and I still want. I'm not going to desert you. I'm here for you. So in order to mentor as many young people as possible, we set up, it's a Ponzi-type pyramid, although we're not scheming, we're not conning people, where a mentor will mentor five young people, and there's a mentor coordinator above that mentor that handles five mentors. So you get these pyramids of people who care for each other, who mentor one another, who listen to one another. And we don't have any... Um, we don't have any exclusion factors. In our space, uh, the youth center inside of the, the camp, we're the only youth center, by the way, in the Zatari refugee camp. Um, we don't require that you turn your pockets out to come in. So if you're a 14-year-old guy, you very likely have a piece of aluminum that you've found, a scrap, and you've sharpened the end of it, and it becomes your knife. <laughs> And that makes you feel like you're a man, you're, you're safe. But you're actually scared to use it because you never knifed anybody before, but you've got one. So when you come into our space, we don't ask you to leave your knife outside. We just put, pair you with a mentor who's with you the whole time. And after two or three days, you stop bringing your knife. Because you didn't feel comfortable with it. Nobody else felt comfortable with it, so why would you need it if you were safe? So there's such simple little things to do. Uh, I'll say one more thing. We have interns, we have a cooperative relationship with Tufts University. And we take two kinds of interns. We take interns who are almost finished their, their university, or they have just finished, and those can qualify as uh, non-Arabic speaking staff, because all of our full staff are Arabs. And we take a small number of interns who are in the middle of their college careers to give them a, it's a shorter term experience. The, the benefit on both sides of this kind of, of uh, bringing people from the outside and listening to how they see things and letting them see how people on the inside see things is phenomenal. There's nothing quite like it. 
So that's QuestScope. That's our 1,600 staff and volunteers inside Syria. Uh, we have 40 Jordanian staff in Jordan and another 300 mentors and in the camp, uh, the Zatari camp. And we have another 100 sites scattered throughout Jordan where young people can get an, an informal, attend classes outside the formal system to maintain their education. Now I'm ready for questions. I'm ready to be guided by you. And come on, I didn't do that good a job, so you can ask questions. Thank you very much. And if you would uh, raise your hand, we have microphones in the audience, and when we get one to you, if you, you guys can, can ask also, so. please stand and uh, give us your first name and uh, give us a something that ends in a question mark. Uh, all the way in the uh, center about rear there. Thank you. Uh, first off, thanks for coming. My name's Jake, and my question is, if I were a refugee, it's a two-fold question. How would I become registered, and how would that affect my future as a refugee? Thank you. Uh, if you're in Jordan, uh, you apply at the United Nations High, Commission, High Commissioner for Refugees, and you fill out lots of paper, and you wait. And if the committee that approves you as a refugee meets and reaches your piece of paper and has all the information that they need, then they certify you as a refugee. But there's also a quota. So six months later, you may need to come back and renew all of your paperwork again so that you can wait again. So if you are approved by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees after one or two or three of these six-month periods, then you are entitled to food rations, you're entitled to uh, help some measure of health care, your children are entitled to go to some kind of school, and you cannot, uh, a policeman can't find you on the street, recognize your language, your uh, dialect as Syrian, and haul you off to the border and kick you out. You're actually protected by law. So it's not a great status, but it's better than no status. Yes, um, my name is, excuse me, my name is Claire, and my question is, um, do many of the refugees speak English, uh, or are there interpreters available? Um, maybe one or two percent speak English. It actually could be higher, it could be five percent who can speak some English, but actually uh, giving and receiving information and understanding, it's, it's pretty small. Uh, interpreters, we don't use interpreters because all of our staff speak Arabic, but there are interpreters. Uh, hi, I'm Danny, and I'm just wondering, uh, besides the countries directly bordering Syria, what other countries are taking in refugees, and what, what limits uh, how many refugees a country can take in? Um, if you can get to Europe, of course, uh, to claim asylum, then in countries like Germany, France has taken some refugees. Uh, your England has promised to take some refugees. The issue is getting to Europe. Um, and the reason that's an issue is European embassies in the Arab world will not receive you as a refugee and allow you to apply there. So by definition, you have to take that life-threatening, harrowing journey, either with the snake heads or on rafts or however you, you get there. So. Um, apparently, some 200,000 to 300,000 people will be able to take refuge in Europe. And apparently, our government is opening up its uh, capacity to, t to increase our quota for refugees. Hi, my name is Jane, and my question is, what do you see as the future for Syria, and whether there is ever going to be the possibility that Syrians would be able to return to their country? And what do you think Assad and Putin are up to? 
Uh, let me check here for what Putin is doing. <laughs> um, the first question, if I could answer that, I would get a Nobel Prize, okay? Um, so, I'm a good Middle Easterner after 35 years, so I have opinions about things, you know, which may be founded or unfounded. Um, Syria is doomed. It's just doomed. When you let the genie out of the bottle, you know, um, if you read sociology, there is a guy named Ryzard Kapuczynski, like the coffee, cappuccino coffee, Polish sociologist, who r writes in, in a little tome about revolution. He says, revolution is possible when somebody wakes up one morning and says, I'm not afraid anymore. There's nothing to lose. So Syrians who saw this potential of not being afraid in what we call the Arab Spring, we call it the Arab Winter, okay, moved. But at the same time, other forces are moving also. Um, with the breakdown of state control of violence, because we really depend on the state, any state, to control who can be violent in our, in our borders, you know, in anyone's borders. Then all kinds of proxy fighters have come in. So suddenly Syria is a place where all manner of agendas are being carried out with guns. Not the least of which is the ISIS agenda, whatever that is. Okay. Um, so it's doomed. Uh, it would require that the countries who are fueling the thing or who are not defueling it, you know, would come together and say, we can't, this can't go on. We have to stop, we have to reduce the number of people who will die. We have to have a political, we gotta have some political steps. Um, Putin and Assad. Um, Putin, is not, Putin is a new name, but Russians have been active, very active in Syria since the early 60s. They were the supporters of the Assad regime. Um, and of course, remember the Cold War? You guys, of course, don't remember the Cold War, but I remember the Cold War. There was something called a Cold War, okay? <laughs> And, but you see spy movies, okay? You never saw the man from Uncle, I'm sure, all right? <laughs> at least smile at me. Don't make me feel too bad, all right? <laughs> so there was a good hey, These are smart dad. kids from uh, <laughs> our high schools are top rate, so don't get right. lighten up. So there's good guys and bad guys. And uh, we were the good guys, and those guys were the bad guys. Um, so we, it, if we slip back into the Cold War mentality, this can be very bad. Um, Putin, of course, if he's there, he's going to do stuff that also benefits Russia. But, editorial opinion, we need to talk and say, it's no longer a matter of you win, I lose, I win, you lose. It's a matter of a whole country of 22 million people are going to lose. And everybody's going to lose if they lose. So, come on, let's, let's rethink the game. We can do this. We're the United States of America. We've done it before. We do diplomacy in very hard places. And that's what's needed. Um, it doesn't really answer the question what Putin and Assad are up to, but um, I don't know that even they know. Hi. I'm Susan. And my question, um, what can we do today and what can we do to help uh, be a solution to this issue? <clears throat> the, um, this is not my pitch, okay? Because I'm not really going to make a pitch. But I'd surely like to get some food to these girls and their families who will be sold. So ensuring that people have food is really, really, really critical. And there are ways to do that. To, um, the, uh, Utopia Foundation is partnering with us and with you know, the college here. Uh, there's room for your spare change. There's room for your $5. There's room for your $10. Uh, and it's very important right now. 
especially because we're going into winter and people will freeze to death in the winter. Um, maybe the second thing is, you know, continue to educate yourself, continue to, under, to, to seek out ways to understand the depth and scope of the problem. Um, and to pick on something that Dave Zinder, pick up on something that Dave Zinder said, uh, you might want to actually let Syrians know in the refugee camp or in the, the broader host communities that you're here and you know that they're there. And so there are ways to do that through social media, through Facebook. We have a, a few, uh, if you have any Arabic speakers in the college, there's an Arabic Facebook and there's an English Facebook. So communicating, donating, and educating are three really important things to do. Um, you could add another tating called agitating. And, and just ensure that your Congress people are okay with increasing the number of, of refugees to be allowed in the country. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not the one who can do that. I'm Judy. I wonder what is the impact of all these refugees on the stability of Jordan because they already have a ton of Palestinian refugees. That's another Nobel question, okay? Uh, Jordan's circumstance with all these Syrians is not a happy circumstance. Uh, you cannot have uh, a million and a half people, half of whom are registered with the UNHCR and half of whom are not. You cannot have a million and a half people of a population of five million who have no livelihoods. This is a, a recipe for complete destabilization. So how we've gotten this far is a miracle. Can the miracle last? I don't know. It's quite, quite serious. Quite serious. So I, I don't have an answer to say that it's dire. And I, there's not a real plan for it. I, I um, belong to the group that does the Jordan response plan. And the response plan is not uh, a complete response. So the issues of Syrians being you know, given food and given, you know, doled out some resources is one thing. But the issue for Syrians to make a life for themselves has, has not been addressed. Uh, oh. Um. Okay. I don't know. Is this on? If you've got it, use it. Yeah. All right. Um, my name is David, and in terms of the two forces that we've been discussing, ISIS and the Assad regime, I'm wondering if, either anecdotally or percentage-wise, the people with whom you work fear and dread one of those perils more than the other because it's sort of bad cop, bad cop, and I'm wondering which they dread more. Boy, these are really good questions. I wish you had a good answer. Or, um, I sat in a, you guys know Davos, right? The guys that meet once a year in January at the World Economic Forum and they decide how the world should look. And it's kind of like an economic Prada type of thing. Um, well, I'm, I'm part of that group, uh, although I can't pay the fee, so I'm, I'm one of the poor cousins that they allow to come. And we meet alternatively in the Jordan in the summer at the Dead Sea. And in a room about this size, with about a thousand people in it, highly select people, people who are you know, VIPs, we're all sitting there, and we're discussing these issues of ISIS. And finally, a woman who sit, sat right behind me, is a journalist from Lebanon, stood up and she said, I just have one question for us. She said, who is ISIS? Well, in that group of a thousand people, there's somebody who knows. And most of us haven't a clue. 
And of course, nobody talked, because the guys who don't know don't have anything to say. And the guys who do know don't want anybody to know that they know, right? So no sound was made. For a thousand people who are used to talking so the rest of the world will listen, to be silent, who is ISIS? We don't know. We don't know what their ultimate agenda is. We don't know where their real funding comes from. We don't know how they popped up, fully formed. You know, uh, where did they get their media guys? Because their media guys aren't Arabs. They don't speak Arabic. Uh, they speak flawless English. Um, so we're more, everybody is more afraid of ISIS as a mentality than they are of Assad. Uh, if things, if you could, uh, probably we can live with Assad. Probably we cannot live with ISIS. Now we're talking about the need for security so you're not shelled or bombed and you could possibly go back to your house and maybe start rebuilding. So we're not talking about long-term solutions here. Uh. Um, I was wondering, as you mentioned before, like women, but specifically girls, are often the first ones to be neglected during war times. So I was wondering, um, what does Questcope do to stop this from happening? And also, how do you think the girls should be properly represented during these? awful times? <clears throat> That's a, a very interesting question. Certainly, uh, females are more at risk, and I'm doing this because I want to explain something about it, are more at risk in war. But up until recently, they're also not considered combatants. So if they are killed, it's, here's a terrible word, right? It's collateral, it's not on purpose. Um, they also tend to have to live with less food. You know, they're they're on the edge. For this part of this period of history in this part of the world, the most neglected are actually young males. There are no UN programs for young Arab males. In the Zatri refugee camp, there are programs for young females because for 25 or 30 years, guess what the UN system has been developing? Programs for young females, and rightfully so. But there are no programs for young males. Um, a young Arab male, anybody in here got gelled hair? I don't have enough hair to gel, but if you have gelled hair, there's somebody's pointing here, okay. So if, if you're an Arab guy and so you're, you're 16 and you've got your hair gelled exactly like this, and you have the jacket, you know, and it's exactly like this, and you stand just like this, are you a beneficiary? You're a threat, okay? So aid workers will avoid you. They don't know what to do with you. Our experience with these young men in particular is that they are scared snotless. That's why they posture and position, but there are no programs for them. So in the youth center that we have and in the um, informal education centers, which are open, of course, to males and females, you make it welcoming and inviting for both genders. We have women who are very strong leaders uh, and, women, and men who are very strong leaders. And we have joint activities as well as separate activities. Um, so my, my final answer to you is, if you treat people equally, even though you might have to treat them separately according to the culture, that's a very important thing to do for young people. You have particular issues of reproductive health. Uh, young females, if you can't buy sanitary pads, what will you do? Who will you talk to? Where will you get them? So there's specific things to do for reproductive health for females, and there's specific things to do for young males. Um, the programs for females are much stronger than for males. We have both, but we're essentially the only organization that concentrates on males. It won't stay that way because the problem is very evident now. So there are a lot of, of masculinity experts who are starting to talk, which is very, very good.
Hi, my name is Bill. Uh, thank you so much for the work you do. It sounds like Jordan does more than its share uh, to try to help refugees. And then we hear stories of other Middle Eastern countries, specifically Saudi Arabia, that has some city that could house 100,000 people except for five days a year uh, that's sitting empty because it's uh, reserved for the pilgrimage. I don't understand the position of the other Middle Eastern countries that are not helping their brethren, or are these stories false? And in fact, um, they're all doing their share of work. Thank you. Um, I'll answer that with a story. If you, if your grandfather or his father uh, went to Dubai, so this would be shortly in early 1900s, and you worked, and he worked, and he brought his wife from Egypt or wherever he came from, and had children, and those children grew up, and they worked, and they had children, now we're to where we are in history, you will never be a citizen of Dubai, ever. The only people that can be citizens of Dubai are the original Dubai people. Same for Saudi Arabia, same for every, every place. I think possibly Bahrain is the only exception where you can get citizenship. So in that part of the world, uh, of great shortage at one time, you don't want people coming in and becoming citizens, and you don't want to take care of people that aren't your own. Partly because nobody took care of you, you know, when you were poor. So this is the story that indicates some of the mindset that uh, is behind the fact that there's not a, a whole lot of welcome in certain countries in the Arab world for refugees. Hi, my name is Clara. I have two questions. First, thank you so much for all you do. It's very admirable. Um, my first question is, what is your opinion or view or knowledge on Western women going into Syria and trying to help? And my second question is, is there anyone going into Syria and trying to get these people out, these people in these horrible conditions? Is there anyone in the midst of the action trying to help? Next question. <laughs> that one's really hard. Um, <clears throat> hold me to the two questions. I'm going to tell another story to try to get around to the to context. There are three drivers for, that push young people towards violent extremism in whatever you know, level of it. And one of those drivers is a massive reaction against injustice, people being treated unfairly, people not having adequate chances, always seeing the same bureaucrat's hand in the same till, nobody else getting a chance. So massive injustice drives young people in the Middle East. Not unlike what drives you, okay? Everybody's kind of fed up with the system and the way it works. I'm not talking about America, okay? I'm talking about the Arab world. You know, just fed up. The same guys always show up, the same talking heads, the same people win, the same people lose. It ain't working, guys, in the political system in the Middle East, okay? So part of the Arab Spring was a re reaction against this. So you have a lot of young people in the Arab world who are driven for, to increase justice and to belong. A sense of alienation drives you because you want to belong. Because, to my mind, because that parallels very closely with what Western youth are feeling, because I'm no longer a youth, and I'm, but I'm still partly Western, okay? Um, it makes sense for some people to think, well, I could go to Syria and I could do something with my life, something good. Um, so there's, there's a, a, a newspaper or an article in the New York Times about a Canadian model who decided to go to Syria and work with the Free Syria Army, whichever one of the 50 Free Syrian armies it is, okay? 
Um, so there's, a, there's a, a drive to help people do things better and to do something good with your life. There's also what I would call uh, mis misdirected desires, because some young people also join the, uh, the ISIS side of the equation, which is a, a different answer to your question. Um, your second question was? That, I thought that was the Western women, women side. Okay, it was the second question. Uh, the second question was, is there anyone going into the action in the middle of Syria and getting people out? Yeah, the, 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 yeah the, the, who's going into Syria to get people out, to, to save them, right? But which of the eight million would we take? You know? And I don't mean that harshly or facetiously. I mean, the... The idea of getting Syrians out of Syria is only going to work for, you know, 10,000, 50,000. Uh, actually making the place different is, is what it's going to take. Okay? There are, yeah, yeah that's, that's what it will take. Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Ed. Uh, I had a question. Uh, You've talked a lot about the refugees that are in uh, Jordan and Lebanon. I uh, wonder if you could comment a little bit more on the current wave of refugees from Syria that's headed to Europe. Uh, how, how are they different? Are these just more of the same people who are headed to Europe because the camps in Jordan are full? Or are they a different kind of people? Are they going because things in Syria are going from bad to worse? Uh, maybe you gave a little part of the answer a few minutes ago when you were talking about no programs for men because I understand a high percentage of the people transiting through the Balkans now are young men. But um, uh, what's behind the exodus to, uh, to Europe and why is it happening now when so many people left earlier for other destinations? I mean, the, the other earlier destinations, you mean to, to the yes. neighboring countries? Yes. Um, well, it's like we mentioned earlier about Jordan. If you can't work, you can't get a job, I mean, and you're an engineer, would you like to sit for five years or 10 years or 20 years and your skills are getting out of date? So you will, you will go for something different that you hope will be better. The, uh, of the one, refugees that I know, or the people from Syria, the internally displaced persons, they tend to be more educated, and it's, it used to take $20,000 to pay a smuggler to get you to Europe. Now it's only 3000 because the market grew and competition between smugglers grew, so the price dropped. Market economy, right? Okay. So now it's $3,000 to go, and people will pay it. Um, therefore, the, refugee, the traveling refugees tend to be more educated, and at least they had the 3,000. Uh, New York Times article said, if you're going to be a refugee in Syria, you need three things, a good backpack, a good pair of walking shoes, and a smartphone. And then the guy, the Syrian who's set, talking, he said, because you know, Syrians aren't stupid. We can use technology. We used it in Syria. We can find our way. So in general, those are the kinds of people who are going to Europe. Why are they mostly young men? Because either they have mothers and sisters and stuff back home that they're trying to find a way. If they can get there, they can get them there. Or there are husbands who leave their families behind because it's too dangerous. Um, my name is Cole. And I was wondering what you realistically realistically hope to see come out of this situation in the Middle East currently in the next 10 or 20 years? <laughs> what I hope for is that conversations at high levels can take place it would be more intent on not seeing every Syrian dead. 
You know, I don't want to see 22 million people dead or displaced from their homes. And that will require people who don't normally think they can sit together, whether they're Iranians or uh, Hezbollah people from the south of Lebanon or Americans or Russians. That I believe that we could sit and talk and we could come up with a political solution. That is my hope. Hi. I'm right here. I'm right here. Um, hi, I'm Ali, and um, I just want to ask, um, what's the everyday, like, like just day-to-day -day life for people like our age? Like, what's the duty in the refugee camps, and like, what's a normal day for a Syrian refugee or any refugee in a refugee camp? Uh, good question. It depends on the organization that you're associated with. Um, the, uh, some uh, organizations, because you have to organize stuff, right? So some organizations, uh, young people assist elderly people in standing in line for bread. So instead of an 80-year-old woman standing in line for bread, an 18-year-old will stand in her place. Um, other people have wheelbarrows and they help people move, their, move goods around. Uh, other young people help at the reception area, that when you come in as a new refugee, do you know where to go? Do you have somebody to help you carry your stuff? Um, some, uh, now we're talking you know, 18 to 30 year olds, will help in, uh, as teacher's aides. Some will help, because there are schools inside the camp. Some will help with, uh, you know, playing hoops, you know, with kids who are beneficiaries of programs. If you're in our program, you generally start work at 8 in the morning and you finish at 8 at night. And you have an con ongoing cycle of mentoring and meeting. And we provide bicycles for all the mentors. Because two and a half square miles is still two and a half square miles. So you can bike over to see uh, your mentee if he or she doesn't show up. Those are the best cases. In some cases, you don't have anything to do. And in some cases, you're part of the recruitment mechanism to send young people back to fight in Syria. So it depends on who you're associated with. Hi, I'm Alexa. Um, my question for you is, how does this affect your life personally interacting with these people every day and forming relationships and just putting roots down in this really violent and chaotic place? Uh, in the camps, you mean, or outside the camps? Um, in the camps. In the camps. Um, well, there aren't a whole lot of people that look like me who've been in the Arab world for 35 years and speak Syrian Arabic, okay? So I have a lot of friends. And I'm a grandpa. I'm a totally non-threat, right? Um, and I know lots of stories after 35 years. Uh, and I'm fairly well known in the camp, too. Um, so actually, my organization uses me, you know, exploits me. How about that word? Um, so that when people, especially the families of young people, so if you're between 18 and 30, your, your family is still interested. Are you being sucked into some kind of weirdness? So to meet somebody that's old and speaks Arabic and probably lived where they lived at one time and was also a professor, I mean, these are validation things, you know, that uh, that's the thing that I bring. Um, I have eight and a half grandchildren. The other half is due on Thanksgiving Day. So I'm not sure if the Syrian crisis messed up my life or if all the grandkids did. <laughs> but I have to get over here now frequently to see them too. So these are all under 12 and all boys. <laughs> and all from one daughter. <laughs> not the one who teaches Arabic, OK? Uh, hello, my name's uh, Alexander. Uh, my question to you gentlemen uh, is, what is your opinion on our blame as Americans on the Syrian crisis and what's happening with them? 
with our invasion of Iraq and the capitulation of the former regime and the destabilization of that whole region. Oh boy, I have to stand up for that one. <laughs> there are no good guys in white hats in the Middle East. Everybody wears black, okay? I wear black because I'm colorblind, but in the Middle East, there are no good guys, and we are definitely not good guys in the Middle East, you know? Um, sometimes we're good and sometimes we're not, and sometimes we're not and sometimes we are. But in general, we probably, to think about a country and destabilizing it and then doing nothing to stabilize it is, is really a catastrophe, which is the story of Iraq. Um, I'll just stop there. We've, we've interjected ourselves in places where we didn't really want to be, where we didn't, we didn't really, shouldn't ought to have been. That's not good English, right? But you can say that in Arabic. And uh, so we, now the, everybody gets to pay the price for this exuberant, uh, misguided activity. So would it have happened anyways? any way because of our intervention, or did it escalate because of our intervention and destabilization? Would it have happened anyway? Yeah. Uh, well, no, this, is a, this one I can handle easier, OK? Um, the Arab world was ripe for change. Because you can't, I mean, if you're Egyptian, when your parent was born, Mubarak was president of Egypt, and when you're born, he's still president of Egypt. That's kind of weird, right? To be president for that long. And I think he was planning on being president for life. That doesn't really feel like democracy, right? But it was kind of cool with world powers, and everybody was going along with it. I, mean, I got a State Department guy standing here beside me, so this is, um, I'm way out of my limb here. So, <clears throat> The Arab world was ripe for change, and that's what young Arabs thought would, could happen. And it didn't happen. So all, we were ripe for change. That it happened so, so violently, you can never say that violence is inevitable. Violence is a series of choices um, and a series of policies that, you know, well, if they don't do what we like, let's just bomb them. You know, this is not a good way to do foreign policy. So, yes, there would have been change. We were overdue for it, and change will probably sort itself out in 80 years. Um, I, uh, my name is Mark, and Are you the guy with the gel. Is I'm the guy with the gel. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, uh, I can't see you, so I'm not making fun of you. I was just, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, my question would be, with so many people making this really perilous journey across the Mediterranean um, to get to Europe, um, and so many, you know, so many people dying in accidents and things along the way, how are Mediterranean nations and Mediterranean coast guards and things, how are they dealing with this and making it safer in a way for these migrants? Like this. If you ignore the problem, surely it will go away. I, that, that's the, the shortest answer. There's, there's no policy. The European Union, in fact, is about to break up because of not being able to agree what to do about refugees. It's pretty serious. You, you just can't ignore a reality. That's the short answer. There is a longer answer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Channing. I just, for the displaced refugees that do finally make it to Europe, Lance Austria is receiving 14,000 refugees a day, and their town alone is providing food and water and shelter and has met way beyond their capacity, and there is no funding at all through United Nations, through World Food Program. What is their next step for the 14,000 people per day that are coming into this literally tiny hill town of Austria 
making it over the border? Um, the only answer is that their authorities will take it seriously and help them. So the, the country of Austria to provide funding? And do they have to provide the certification via refugee that takes six months to apply for? Nobody knows, because UNHCR hasn't functioned in Europe since the 40s. So nobody knows actually what you will do when the flow of refugees goes the other way. And that's part of the, the consternation of the European Union now, is what do we actually do? Who actually certifies? Who actually verifies? Who actually validates? But 14,000 people a day, can't, you can't turn your back on them. And the only, the only entity that could do anything about it is an entity that controls political decision making, which by definition is usually the government. It's, I'm not, it's not an answer, it's a context for an answer, okay? My name is Abigail, and I'm sorry if this is too personal a question, but I'm really curious about the human side of all of this for you as well as the refugees because, I mean, I've never been outside the country and I'm guessing that most of the people in this auditorium haven't been in a Syrian refugee camp. So I was wondering if you could talk for a little bit about how your experiences and dedicating your life to this has changed you just as a human. Everybody has a story, and nobody's story is unimportant. And we, refugees share a common story because they all had to move somewhere, but each person also has their own story. So you can't do what I've done for 35 years and not be nourished by the people who went through the suffering and pain. So it's as I, as I listen to their stories and listen to what they have overcome and even listen to their kindness to talk to me because I am an American and we were part of the problem, right? That nourishes me in my inside soul, in my inside spirit. Bijuati nafsi ana, if there's any Arabs in the room. It's my deepest self inside. I would say the same for my wife and the same for my daughters when they lived with us in the Middle East. Uh, otherwise, you just can't. Either you can't keep going on or it becomes mechanical. Yes, line up, here's the next handout. Here's the next person, here's the next handout, which is completely dehumanizing to the person doing it and the person receiving it. So it's the, it's the person that nourishes me. Last question, please. Last question. Who is it going to be? My name is Art, and uh, I just want to uh, understand this a little better. Uh, going back to a couple of comments you made, uh, so uh, this problem is going to go on forever the way it is. But you said you lived in Syria for a while, and you loved it. said Syria is doomed. Could it be possibly be saved? Let's say, and there are no good guys, as you said. Could it be possibly be saved if the US and Russia got together with Assad to try and rebuild Syria, get rid of ISIS, rebuild Syria, and then moderate Assad? Is he possibly, could he possibly be moderate? Can Syria be saved by Syria, the United States, and Russia, the, the three most powerful countries, probably. Uh, definitely. That, that is the salvation of Syria, that we would get together. When I use the term doom, I'm thinking about Frodo, okay, <laughs> who faced the doom, you know, he's got the ring, and his doom is he's got to throw it into the cracks of doom. So it's not doom like there's no hope for Syria. But the, the so Frodo's got to get the ring in the cracks of doom. And the cracks of doom are that Russia and the United States and whoever would sit down. No preconditions, no Assad, you have to go before we talk. We just need to stop the slaughter. 
And we could do that if we wanted to. So you're right on, sir. You're right on. There are, there are cards. If you want to say, I'd like to know more, Kurt, we have cards somewhere. You can also sign away the rights to your firstborn and donate to us. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you very much.